Okay, today we're going to uh, cover Hosea, Hosea chapter 1. We're going to read Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Biri, in days of Uzziah, Zotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife, a whoredom, and have a children of a whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Omar, the daughter of Dibeline, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. And I will put on end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow, a bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name, No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to give them at all, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow, or by sword, or by war, or by horses, or by horsemen. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son, and the Lord said, Call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where he was said to them, You are not my people. It shall be said to them, Children of the living God, and the children of Judah, and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head. And they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Um, I think most of us kind of heard about the story of Hosea. How many of you are actually familiar with the story of Hosea? And Hosea is a very important book for us to understand. Um, if you don't understand this Hosea, um, you don't understand why God had to uh, destroy the Israel. This is the book that actually explains why God actually did what he did. Um, so I just want to make sure um, we want to actually hear this, you know, the God's story very clearly because some of the folks who actually read the story and, and, and knew about the story they kind of know as a story but if you know it as a story you're not really understanding the book of Hosea this is a really important book for us to understand and I will explain why and first of all before we actually go over um, just something for us to remember. Do you remember the last king's name of the uh, Israel? Do you remember the last king of the Israel? Anyone remember? Hmm? That's correct. Hosea. last prophet of the Israel is also Hosea so last king of the Israel and last prophet of Israel both name the same thing Hosea so just remember it's a very easy to remember so let's repeat the last king of Israel and last prophet of Israel they both name Hosea but now let's think about what is a Hosea? Does anyone know the meaning of a Hosea? What, 
kind of like we talked about you know, a while ago, but I don't know if anyone remembers. That shit actually reminds you of something. Hosea. Hosea, the uh, name actually derived from the root word Yasha. Yasha means deliver. It means deliver. So Hosea is almost the same thing as Joshua and Isaiah. Hosea, it's the same thing. It means salvation. Deliver me. It's, it's, it means a salvation. So it's like crying out to the Lord, please save me, as they are actually being destroyed. Salvation is what the Israel is needed. So let's take a look at the map here for a second. Remember this uh, table that I shared multiple times? I know Daisy already printed this out, so she has it very handy right now. But uh, for, for most of you, don't. So I'm going to just share. So when you look at the verse 1, the Hosea, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Biri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. So let's take a look at this the left side is Jude, uh, the king of Judah. So which king? The first king was Uzziah. Uzziah. Right here. Second king? Jot uh, Jotham, right? Jotham. And the next king? Yeah, Ahaz, and the next, Hezekiah. So, Hosea was a prophet during all these four kings. When the Israel king was ruling the land of his, uh, Judah. And when you look at, And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So that Jeroboam, it is not the first, the Jeroboam the first, but the but the Jeroboam the second. So as you can see, he was a prophet for a long time. Right? So if he was a prophet from like let's say time of Uzziah to Hezekiah, how long he has he been prophet? From here? to hear at least at least probably 60 somewhat years right at least so he was the prophet for a long long time compared to Amos Amos Actually, pro he, he acted as a prophet for a very short period of time, which is the book that we actually learned last week. So, Amos and Hosea, they were, they were actually, you know, preaching to the people of Israel at the same time. But the difference is, Amos just spoke, and then since he came from south of Judah, he didn't stay too long in Israel, because everyone rejected him. You know, the people of Israel did not want him to stay there. So Amos did not really uh, act as a prophet for a long time. But Hosea was, was from originally Israel, and he actually preached to the people for a long period of time. So we can see, as you can see here, you see this Amos and Hosea. So as if it looked like Amos actually, um, you know, worked a very long time, but this is not true. But as you know, 
Jonah was also acted, you know, it was a prophet during the time of Jeroboam too. Remember? So these three um, prophets were there. They were actually um, preaching at the same time, but the Hosea was the longest time. Okay. So there are three prophets was at work. So that my question is this. If we have many prophets are in at work, what does that mean to us? So that means time is evil. The more prophets that he sends, that means the times is evil. That's why God is sending more prophets to preach, to let them know and giving them a warning as much as he could. So it's not one, it's sending two, it's sending three. So God has kept sending people, warning them, but the people are not listening to the prophets. And remember, you know, last week I asked, you know, asked this question. God knows, God knows that they're not going to change their heart. Why is he sending prophets then? If God already knows that they're not going to listen to it, why would he send it? Don't bother. Like, just don't send anyone. But if you don't send, if God does not send, what would people say? You didn't warn us. You didn't warn us. You didn't do anything to, for us. So they had the other reason they're going to complain. You didn't do anything for us. You said you loved us, but you didn't care for us. That's not true. God continually showed them that I care. God continually showed them and dem demonstrated them how much he cares and how much he has heard it for what they're doing. But just they didn't pay attention at all. So the reason in chapter 1 and verse 1, Hosea wrote it very long verse and say I worked from this king to this king I worked for 60 years minimum it means I was there to continually letting them know God wrath is right around the corner for a long time but even though he kept preaching and preaching nobody cared why why what why was this happening in the time of Jeroboam the second? Hmm? Yes. So they pretty much have um economic power right they're they were living very well they're expanding their military power was there everything what they wanted was there time of prosperity Jeroboam the second was the most pro prosperity time of Israel they were enjoying everything but when they were actually so prosper and enjoying the fruit that was the most wicked time of Israel. And God is telling us how long he's been kept telling people and kept telling people. All right. So let's go to the second verse. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have a children of whoredom. 
I want you to put yourself in Hosea's shoes. Hosea, first of all, he's getting married, right? So he's a single now, right? That means he's not, he's not old, right? When God spoke to him, he was young. He wants to get married, right? So he was young, which means he has passions. You know, he's got like, he wants to do a lot of stuff and he's the prophet. So it's like this. God is actually telling, you know, the pastor who just like became a pastor and he has a lot of passions to run church. Like he's a very excited, like, oh, okay, I'm going to just do something for the, for the Lord. And the first message he got was, I want you to go and uh, marry to a prostitute. How would you feel? <laughs> you just became a pastor and you got a lot of passion and you were thinking about doing something for the Lord. But the first message he got was like, marry to a prostitute. I mean, you have to think from Hosea's perspective. How would he feel? I mean, he would probably say, "Like, wait a second, wait. did I did I did I hear right? Did did you? Are, are you talking to the right right person here, Lord? I'm a prophet. I don't know if maybe you forgot that I'm a prophet, but are you sure you're talking to me? Right?" I'm sure it's a big surprise for Hosea. Hold on a second, Lord. I'm trying to be a prophet and I'm trying to preach your word, Lord. You're asking me to marry to a prostitute? This doesn't sound right to me. I thought you're supposed to give me some like noble woman or something, right? It just makes no sense. But you have to look at it from two different perspectives. Now, I said you need to put yourself in Hosea's shoes first. That's the first perspective that you need to feel. How would he feel when he received that message? Second perspective that you need to put is Put yourself in God's shoes. What is God doing right now? What is he trying to tell Hosea? Right? So you have to look at it from two perspectives. Hosea's perspective, you have to look at it from God's perspective. What is he, what is he doing? So, I'm just going to open this up to uh, everyone. What do you think? What, what do you think God is doing? Exactly. Here's the thing. Hosea is a prophet. He thinks he knows a God's heart. I know, Lord. I know. The Israel is hurting you. I know. I feel it. I understand. That's why I'm trying to be, you know, a prophet. I'm, I'm preaching to the people of Israel. I know exactly your heart. God is saying this. Hosea, let me tell you something. You don't understand. You don't understand how I feel. You say you understand, but you don't know. You know, there are a few of us have a children. Right? We think we know our parents' heart. Right? We knew, we 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 thought we knew our parents' heart. But we didn't know until we became a parent and having our children behaving the way they're behaving. We started to understand how our parents felt as we became a parent. 
Did we? We thought we knew. We understood our parents. I know how you feel. We understand. I know everything. Did we? Not really. Not really. You know, we kind of had the conversation at the beginning of our, our, our Bible sharing. Is that, you know, Vicky was saying, like, you know, grandchildren. Yeah, we may say, like, I know how to become a, a you know, grandma and grandpa and having a, taking care of the, you know, their grandchildren. We think we understand. We don't. Until we became ourselves a grandpa and grandma and the future, then we would understand. We vividly just, we kind of guess how she feel and how, you know, the grandpa would think. But we don't really know how they feel until we became. For a single, most of people say, I know what it's a marriage life like, you know, like, I know. I know. You know, I when I get married, I know this is how I'm going to live. I know, I know, I perfectly understand. Wait until you get married and have years of, uh, you know, marriage life with your spouse, then you would understand. When we all got married, you know, it was a happily ever after, right? Like the story of a Disney, right? Everything will be just hunky dory. We're going to be like happy all the time, right? Wait until you get married. It might not be the same as what you think. It's much more challenging. It requires a lot of work. It is not going to be like happily ever after for sure. Unless you work very, very hard to make that happen. Right? That's the point. Hosea is telling God, I know how you feel, Lord. And God is saying, Hosea, you have no idea what I feel. You have no idea how I feel about Israel. I, I want to tell you something, Hosea. I want you to get married to a prostitute. W what do you mean? W what do you mean? Just get married to a prostitute. Soon as he actually marries the prostitute, will he be able to effectively preach to the people? <laughs> it's going to be pretty tough for him, right? If he if he marries to a like prostitute, what is he going to say? He's going to say, "Well, hold on, hold on, guys. I, I got married because God told me to." Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I I get it. I get it. Right? The message won't be heard the way he expected. Because nobody understands it. So, Lord, okay, you asked me to get married. I'll do it because you you tell me so. You tells me so, so I'll do it. So I want you to get married to the to a prostitute, right? And then I want you to have a child. But to your child, you're going to have you're going to have children of whoredom. <laughs> what is this? Are you actually just like, you know, cursing at me? Not only just getting married to the you know, the prostitute, my children is going to be the same. What do you expect me to do? I want you to have the children of whoredom. I mean, this just, this is cursed. So he said, get married and have a child. So he married to Gomer. And then had a first child. And the first child's name is what? What did he name? First child? Jezreel. Okay. 
we have to understand why he actually says this. This is the key to understand this. First of all, what is Gomorrah's... Um, so God told Hosea to marry to a prostitute. So Hosea got married to Gomer. Gomer, we have to understand what that means. It means to the end. It's end. This is it. Finished. Complete. I'm done. At the end. So what is God telling Hosea? This, this is it. I, there, there's nothing more. And then, when you have a first child, you will name him Jezreel. So let's talk about Jezreel. Do we know anything about Jezreel? Do we know anything about Jezreel? Naboth, right? Ahab took the uh, Naboth vineyard by killing him. He used his wife, right, Jezebel, to kill him, right? He didn't kill him. He didn't put the blood on his hand. But when he came back, he looked, he had a very long face, right? And he wasn't eating well. So his wife just came to him like, what's going on? And he said, well, because I wanted to actually have this uh, neighbor's vineyard, but he didn't actually want it to sell, so... You know, I'm sad. And Jez Jezebel said, Are you a king? You can do anything you want. Hold on. Why don't you just go and eat your lunch? I'll take care. I'll get you that vineyard. Right? So he hired a bunch of, like, the bummers and then literally killed a neighbor. And then he actually, she got the, uh, the neighbor's vineyard and gave it to uh, Ahab. Remember that story? And then... They threw the body of Naboth, right, in the Naboth vineyard. And then God said, when God said, I am going to destroy the kingdom of Ahab, who did God use to destroy the kingdom of Ahab? Jehu, right? Jehu. So, God anointed Jehu as the next king, and then he ran, came back to Samaria, right? And he killed who? Who did he kill? Did he kill Ahab? His son. What's his name? Let's go to uh, find out who that was. Let's go to First King chapter nine. First, uh, the second king. I'm sorry, not first king. Second King chapter nine. We're going to read from verse twenty-one. Joram said, Make ready. And they made ready his chariot. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, set out, each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu, and met him at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He answered, 
What peace can there be so long as the whoring and the sorcery of your mother Jezebel are so many? Then Joram uh, reigned about and fled, saying to Ahaziah, Treachery, O Ahaziah! And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulder so that the arrow pierced his heart and he sank in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar, his aside, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember when, I, when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father. How the Lord made his pronouncements against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on the plot of ground. Now, therefore, take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. So, Jeram was Ahab's son. And then he was killed by Jehu, and his body was thrown into the Jezreelite. As God said that he will do. So, Jehu knew. He was taught by the prophet that this is what you will do to destroy the Ahab's family. So, when he heard this prophecy from the prophet, he was doing this at the same time he saw how the Ahab's family destroyed right then he should have listened to what God had to say to him but did he listen he was doing exactly same thing what Ahab did at the beginning he destroyed all the prophets of Baal. That was a good thing he did. Right? He gathered all the priests of the Baals and then he killed them all. Cleaned it off. But soon after he became a king, he was following the same path that Ahab walked. And Jeroboam the second. Which kingdom is that? Yeah, Israel, but who's Jeroboam the second was sons of who? Let's just take a look at the uh, chart again. All right. So Jehu killed Joram, which is the son of Ahab, right? And then Jehu became a king, right? And then he started his own kingdom. And, oops. And then he had Jehoahaz was the son. And Jehoahash became The king and Jeroboam the second became a king so he was following Jehu's line not Ahab's line right Ahab's line is the family of Omri right so family of Omri was destroyed and now he started with the Jehu and then Jeroboam the second is the same line as Jehu that's the fa same family line, right? So, what is a God saying to Hosea and to the Israel? As I have destroyed the Amri's family at Jezreel, since Jehu and their family did not listen and they followed the exact path that Ahab walked I am going to destroy your line just like how I destroyed the Ahab's 
family. Do the exactly same thing. Your sons will be thrown into the Jezreel. I will do the same thing what I have done to Ahab. I'm going to do to you too. You Israelite. That's why God actually named Hosea as the first sons named Jezreel. Because that shows how mad God is. I'm going to destroy you. Does it make sense? This is why God actually, you know, have the Hosea as a first son to name Jezreel, the Valley of Jezreel. And second, after he had first son, now she had, I mean, now he has a second uh, uh, child. And the second child's name was what? Her name is Loru Hama. Loru Hama means I will show no mercy. In Hebrew word lo means no. Donun not. So if ever go to like Israel, if you you know Someone says, do you know how to speak Hebrew? Your answer should be, lo. <laughs> lo. That means no. Ken means yes. Anime the bear, Ibrit. I can speak Hebrew. So, lo means no or not. So, Loru, uh, uh, the uh, Loru Hama. So Loru Hama. So I just mentioned Lo means not. So then the Hama is the name, right? So Hama, it means no. So it's a mercy. Or compassion. Rak, uh, Raham. Uh, so God is actually telling Hosea, I will show no mercy to Israel any, anymore. That is actually the name. I will not going to have any any more compassion, any more, you know, um, the uh, mercies to the Israelites. And third, now he has a third child and name him Loru, uh, Lo Ami. So Lo, we already know what that is. Am means people that means they're not my people I'm going to destroy the Israel at Jezreel I will show no mercy you're not my people so he's so mad now for those of us you know who have a child Sometimes you actually have a very, very heated conversation with your child. And sometimes you're so mad and you say like, you're, Get out of my house! Get out of my room! You're not my son! And sometimes you actually have that kind of like feeling or saying something like that. Right? Why? Because you're so mad. You're so mad. God is showing or demonstrating how he feels to Hosea. Hosea is now just not knowing in his head, but now he start to feel how God feels. I see. 
This is how God feels about Israel. Not what I know. This became my life now. So, once again, when Hosea received the message from the Lord to say, married to a prostitute, most likely his response was, What? Getting married to a prostitute? Probably Ricky could feel much more closer. If God actually told Ricky now, Ricky, I want you to get married to a prostitute. What? Hold hold on. I, I am about to uh, teach the children now. I'm in a child ministry right now. You asked me to get married to pro prostitute? This is something that God is trying to teach Hosea. Hosea, you don't know how I feel. Now I want you to feel what I feel. As a God, perfect God, right? Is married to who? Israel, like prostitute. Is that a, a good match? Perfect, righteous, loving. God married to a prostitute like Israel. Does that, does that, do you think it is a good match? It is not a good match. But that's exactly what God did. Married to Israel. That is like prophet is getting married to a prostitute. And having a like whoredom child. God is saying, I will not. I'm going to destroy you at the Jez, uh, Jez, uh, Jezreel. I'm not going to show any more compassion or mercy. You're not my people. Get out of my way. Now, next thing, what he says is, <clears throat> verse 10. Yet the number of the chi uh, children of Israel shall be like the sand of the, uh, sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or number. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. When you read from verse 10 to the rest of the verse, 11 it makes no sense because verse 10 and 11 completely contradicts of what God just said from verse 2 to 9 because from verse 2 to 9 he was talking about he's going to destroy the Israelite he's going he's no he's not going to show any mercy He's going to actually consider the Israelite is, as a not of his children. But all of a sudden, verse 10, he said, Number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the, sand of the sea. What do you mean? You just said you're going to destroy them. Right? What do you mean they're going to be like sand of the sea? It makes no sense. It completely contradicts what he's saying. Which cannot be measured or number. Which is similar to what he promised to Abraham in Genesis. I'm going to make your child numerous, like the sands of the sea. I will bless them. That's almost the same promise. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. So what he's saying is, I am going to call you as a children of the living God. 
Wait a second. Didn't you just say you were going to just destroy them completely? You are going to just like destroy them like, you know, you destroyed the, uh, Ahab's family? What do you mean you're going to actually call them a child, uh, children of the living God? It's a different message. Verse 10 through 11 is completely different message. But he's saying he's making the promise. I am going to destroy you. I'm not going to show any mercy. I am going to actually consider you as not my people. But one day, one day. I am going to restore you and I'm going to call you as a children of a living God. Listen very carefully in verse 11. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered. They're united again and they shall point for themselves one head. Which head is this? What, what head is this? Which head? What? What did our church calls? We call body of Christ. Head is what? Who is head? Jesus is the head. Right? Jesus is the head. So which head? It's a Jesus. When Jesus comes, he will reunite them. And he's going to call the children of a living God. Who are these children of a living God? We are. We are the children of a living God. He's saying, I am going to completely destroy you. You Israel, Israel, I'm going to completely destroy you, not my people. I'm not going to show any mercy. But one day, one head will reunite them together. And then your children will be numerous as the sand on the seashore. That head is the Jesus. So he's making the promise. I am destroying you now. But I'm not going to completely destroy you. I'm going to leave the last trunk and the root so that it doesn't die. You will regrow. You will be restored. It's not like I'm killing you. I'm not killing you. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to discipline you. But one day you will regrow. Go to chapter 2. So, to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sister, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breast, lest I strip her naked, and I make her as in the days she was born, and make her like a wilderness, make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore, she who conceived them has acted shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lover, who give my bread and my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her path. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she will seek them, but she will not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. 
and she did not know that I that it was I, w I, I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavish on her silver and gold, which they use for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its seasons, and I will take away my wool and my flex, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hands. And I will put an end to her, her mirth, her feast, her new moons, her Sabbath, and her pointed feast. And I will lay waste to her vines and her fig trees, in which she said, There are my wages, which I, my lover have given me. I will make them a forest, and the breast of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days for the Baal, when she burned offering to them, and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers, and forget me, declares the Lord. So, first of all, she said, Say to you, brothers, you are my people, and your sister, you have received the mercy. This is a completely different than their name, isn't it? So they're brother and sisters. They're the, they're the Hosea's children. And their name, I have no mercy. You're not my people, right? But God says, Say to your brothers, You are my people, and to your sister, you have, mer you have, you have received mercy, which opposite from their name. What does that mean? I named you. You're not my people. I named you. I will show no mercy, but... I will show my mercy and I, you, you will be my people and you would understand one day not now you would understand someday that I have mercy on you that I that you will be my people so plead with your mother she is not my wife so Israel God is saying Israel is my wife but you're no longer my wife. I'm not your husband anymore. It's like divorcing. Right? It's like divorcing. You're not my wife. I'm not your husband. We're done. We're, we're through. Right? The she put away her whoring from her face. Because she's kept doing this. She's kept prostituting with another man. Lest I strip her naked and make her as in the days she was born, and make her like wild, uh, wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. I'm going to teach her. Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore, she who conceived them has acted shamefully for she said I will go after my lovers with uh, who give uh, who give me my bread and my waters and my wools and my flex my oil and my drink so what is this Gomorrah thinking all these stuff right it is not from God it is not from my husband right and say, I will go after my lover to get what I need. My bread, my water, right? My flex. They're the one who's going to give me all this. So I'm going to go after them. So who are these lovers? Who are these lovers? That Gomor is associating with. Yeah, is referencing Israel going after idols. Right? Another man. Not the spouse, which is God. They're going after another man. 
right? In order for us to understand, God actually says something in other book which you would understand. Let's turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. It says this. Again, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth are of the land of Can uh, Canaanites. Your father was the Amorites, and your mother a Hittite. And for, uh, as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in sweat, uh, swaddling clothes, nor I uh, pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you. But you are cast out on the open field, for you are abhorred on the day that you were born. So this how the, the, the Israel was like. The baby was born. Nobody actually took care. They didn't even cut the properly cord. No wash. They were thrown into the, the open field. No one really ca cared about this baby. It was just a thrown out. It was banished, abandoned child. No one cared about this baby. The baby is crying and crying. No one give any eyes or no compassion at all. And then I passed by you, saw you were wallowing in your blood. I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant of the field and you grew up and became tall and arrive at full uh, ad adornment. Your breasts were formed, and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you are at the age for love, and I spared a corner of my garments, cover you, and covered your nakedness. I made you, uh, I made my vow to you, Enter into the covenant with you, declared the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with waters and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered clothes and sawed you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk, and I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrist and chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earring in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Though you were adorned with gold and silvers and your clothing was of a fine linen and silk and embroidered clothes, you are fine flowers and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautifully and advanced to loyalty, royalty, <clears throat> and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declared the Lord God. But, here's the key, but I had all this from when you were born, but you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whoring on your passerby your beauty became this you took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shirins and on them play the whore the like has never been nor ever shall be you 
also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver which I had given you and made for yourself image of men and with them played the whore. And you took your embroidered garments to cover them and set my oils and my incense before them. Also, my bread that I gave you, I fed you with the fine flour and oils and honey you set before them for a pleasing aroma, and it was declared the Lord God. And you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had born to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were you whoring so small a matter? Not you slaughtered my children and delivered uh, them up as offering by fire to them? And in all your abominations and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, uh, wallowing in your blood. And after all your wickedness, ooh, ooh to you, declared the Lord God, you built yourself of uh, vaulted chambers and made yourself a lofty place in every square and the head of every street you uh, you built your lofty place and made your beauty and abominations offering yourself to one passerby and multiplying your whoring you are also play the whore with the Egyptians your lustful neighbors multiplying your whoring to provoke me to angers behold therefore I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portions and delivered you to the greed of your enemies and daughters of the Philistines you were ashamed of you lewd behavior you play the whore, uh, the whore also with Assyrian because you were not satisfied yes you played the whore with them and still you are not satisfied you multiplied your whoring also with the trading land of Chaldea and even with this you were not satisfied how sick is your heart declared the Lord God because you did not all uh, you did all these things the deeds of Barazan prostitute building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place in every square yet you are not like the prostitute because you scorn payment adulterous wife who received the strangers instead of her husband men give gifts to all prostitutes but you gave your gift to your lovers bribing them to come to your uh, come to you from every side with your whoring so you are different from other women in your whoring no one solicits uh, solicited you to pity the whore and you gave payment while no payment was given to you therefore you were different do you understand what God is feeling? What would you feel if you are in this position? Do you feel God's heart? If you are God, if you did all this to someone else and then that someone you actually brought as your husband and your wife and that partner you gave everything you could but your partner is whoring with people outside and giving everything what you gave it to her you're giving it to your lover how would you feel do you see the the tears in God's eyes how much pain he's feeling with Israel after he given everything he could from the day that they're they're born when Israel was born God took the baby in, washed it, took care of it, gave the food, put the expensive clothes, put the jewels, ornaments, clothes, made it beautiful. But with that, you started to go out 
and whoring with people. How much how much you know pain would you feel? If you don't understand the pains of God, you're not understanding Hosea. You're not even near understanding what the story of Hosea is. You have to feel this pain and struggles, frustrations, madness. You have to feel what he feels. If you don't, then you have, a, you have no idea what God is doing to Hosea. This is something Hosea is going through. Hosea thought he understood what God feels. Did he? No, he didn't. Until he started to feel himself. What is happening to his own wife? The pain that he has is unbearable. He didn't know what to do about this. He's a prophet. Do you think with this situation, do you think he could actually, you know, act as a prophet while he's going through this pain? That he has to worry about his wife every day? Unless he doesn't care. Unless he, 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 unless he doesn't care, then you can do your work. But if you love your wife, then you can't do your normal stuff. Because your, your mind will be bombarded. And because of the severe pain in your heart, you just can't normally function. That is exactly what Hosea was going through. How is this possible to me? God, what are you, what are you doing this to me? Do you think that Hosea was feeling, oh, I'm so blessed? Do you think he's feeling that? No. It's a misery. It's cursed. It's not something he could easily bear. He's in pain. Now he started to feel how God feels. And now he started to see the tears of the Lord. I see. Now he started to understand. Lord, I said I understood you, but I was wrong. I did not understand what you what you were going through. The tears in your eyes, I did not know. Now I know, Lord, because I feel. I I actually mentioned this to you, you know, multiple times in the past. Remember, as we are growing our child and as we are talking to our children, we understand our, you know, how we feel for our child. We certainly love our child. We do. But sometimes our child just don't listen to us and making me mad. Right? And being disobedient. Sometimes he makes us, you know, sometimes they just pierce our heart. Right? It's like they're like, you know, stabbing at us sometimes it's like so much pain in our heart like oh why are you doing this to me you're my beloved son why are you doing this to me but they don't know what they're doing as they were crucifying Jesus Christ they don't know what they were doing right were they actually crying the most of the Israelites when they were crucifying Jesus no they were shouting out, crucify him, crucify him. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. Not to mention about having the pains. Only the pain that they were having was Mary. Because he, she had to see her child being hanged and crucified and bleed. How would you feel? Isn't that cruel? If you ever watch your son being, you know, crucified, can you can you see that? I don't think anyone could bear 
You cannot see. You cannot open your eyes and watch your being your sons being crucified. You're not going to see it. You're going to probably faint. That's exactly the pain that we need to have in our heart. Unless we have that pain in our heart, we will never going to understand Hosea. So coming back to Hosea again. So Gomer think, thinking all her bread, waters, wool, flax, she was thinking the lover is giving her. Was it? Was her lover giving all this? No. God provided to her. But that's not what she was thinking. So she said, I will follow my lover because my lover is the one who gives me all all I need. They're, they're the supplier. They're the one who's given me what I need. So she was enjoying two things. Number one, she was actually enjoying with this lover because she was the prostitute. She was enjoying it. And two, because they're the one who's giving her what she needed. Food, clothes, for the things that she needed. And what is God saying? Therefore I will hedge, verse 6, Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her path. She shall pursue her lover, but not overtake them. She, she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then, then she will say, I will go back and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. Doesn't it actually remind you of a prodigal son? Isn't that a very similar story? When the prodigal son has nothing to eat, right? Then he remember, oh, in my father's house, there was lots of food. Even the servant of my father was eating well. So now she started thinking, yeah, it was good. My first husband was to took care of me. Now she remember. Now she's thinking about going back after she did everything what she wanted. Then, if, I want you to think, if your partner did this and then came back what would you do one day he or she is knocking on the door hey I'm back if this is your husband if this is your wife what would you do you're gonna open up the door and say he hug him and kiss him and say oh thank God you're back I'm so happy is it what you're going to do? <laughs> or are you going to just pull out the shotgun and then open the door and say, Get out of my way. Don't ever come to me. What would you do? Truthfully, what would you do? Would you welcome? <laughs> You see, what what should Hosea do? We're going to find out exactly what he had to do. But before we get there, we're going to just take a look at verse 9 and 10 again. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its seasons and I will take away my ools and my flex which I were to cover her nakedness now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and no one shall rescue her out of my hand my punishment 
will be severe. I'm going to take everything away from her. Why? Why is God doing this? Why is he taking away all this? That's exactly what he just described in the previous verse. When I take everything away, now you remember my first husband. When I was with my first husband, I was happy and I was getting what I needed. So I want to go back. So God is doing this. I'm going to take taking away everything from you so that you can remember me. Remember the story of Jacob from Genesis when he lost everything that he loved when nothing was left in him then he actually just to turn himself to the Lord and said I surrender Lord I give up everything what I loved I'll come back to you Lord because I got, I got absolutely nothing left because you've taken away everything that I love that's exactly what God did to Jacob and Jacob surrendered to the Lord at that time right that happened in the past but what did Israel do did they surrender no they did not surrender even though God took away everything from them they still did not come back Lord how about this one I want you to think about today for the last year how much people have to suffer because of the COVID-19 how many lives has been taken away how many family members people have lost in the last year because of the COVID-19 how much of a financial impact the people had the business there's so much of a loss right are we coming back to the Lord do you think people are coming back to the Lord no that's what's supposed to happen but that's not happening even though God is actually taking away from us so that we can come back to Him. We don't come back to Him. What do we do? We're still trying to say, we're going to have to work hard to overcome this hardship. Let's work together. Right? Just be patient a little longer. We'll take care of it. Right? We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be over with this. Be positive. Someday we'll get better, right? Positive mindset, right? Look further. That's exactly what the Israelite did. Instead of a turning back to the, to the Lord, they just ignored the Lord's warning. Even today, God is warning us. We're completely ignoring what He's saying. We don't care what He says, what He does. We're just gonna we're just gonna continue to live the way we live. Life goes on. That's exactly what the Israelite did. So what he's saying? Verse eleven. I will put an end to all her mirth, her feast her new moons, her Sabbath, and all her appointed feast. What does this mean? What does this mean? Verse 11. Listen to what God is saying. Gomorrah, while she was doing all this work, she was participating in the feast, she was participating in Sabbath, new moon, as God instructed them to do. She was involved. She was actually in there. And said, I'm going to stop this. 
I don't need to receive this from you because you're just doing this for your own pleasure not for me you're not doing this for me you're just participating in all this activity but it's got nothing to do with me you're doing it because you want it I have not received anything from you In verse 12, I will lay waste to her vines and her feet trees of which she said. These are my wages which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest and the breasts of the field shall devour them. I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals. And she burned offering to them and adorned herself her ring and jewelry and went after her lover and forget me declared the Lord this is exactly what we just read from Ezekiel the story of the Ezekiel who was he actually referring to in the story of Ezekiel who was it speaking to hmm? the story that we read in Ezekiel chapter 16 who was he speaking to No. When did Prophet Ezekiel working? Where did he work? Where did he prophesize? Ezekiel was act as prophets in Babylon. That was after Judah was completely destroyed. So Ezekiel was talking about Judah. So what does that mean? Was Judah any different from Israel? No. They were, they were the same. Israel did Judah did they did exactly the same thing Judah was destroyed by Babylon 150 years after Samaria the Israelite was destroyed so there was about like close to close to about 200 years apart when God actually spoke to Hosea and when Ezekiel said to Judea about 200 years difference but they were doing exactly the same thing they're copying each other they're like twins And we're going to read from verse 14 and on. Therefore, now God is showing mercy. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And, the, and there she shall answer as in the days of her youth and as at the time when she be, she came out of the land of Egypt and in the day declared the Lord you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my Baal for I will remove the name of the Baal from your mouth and they shall be remembered by name no more and I will make for them a covenant on that day with the breast of the field the birds of the heavens and the creeping things on the ground and I will abolish the bow and sword and war from the land and I will make you lie down in safety and I will be betroth you to be forever I will betroth you to me 
in righteousness and in justice. In steadfast love and in mercy I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declare the Lord, I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will saw her for her, uh, her uh, for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say, not my people, you are my people. And sh uh, he shall say, you are my God. When is this happening? When is this happening? When she just comes. Well, this is way, way after Israel was destroyed. But what God is saying, I will restore you. I'm not I'm not going to kill you and, and destroy. I will leave you. I will punish you. I will destroy you. But I will not kill you. I'm not going to wipe you out of this earth. But one day, I will restore you. You will be my wife, and I will be your husband. I will show my mercy, and you will be my people. Remember we talked about Jezreel. Do you know what it means, the Jezreel? Jezreel. Jazreel means is made up of two words of Hebrew. One is Zara. Zara means has a two meaning. It saw or scatter seed or planting seed. When you actually saw on the seed, that's what it means. Zara. And then L obviously means God, right? So what does that mean? God saw or God plans. That's what Jezreel means. It has the two meaning as I said. Zara means what? Scatter, but at the same time plant. Obviously those are two different meanings. Scatter is one thing and planting is one another. But very first time he said Name your son Jezreel. I'm going to scatter you. But this time when he said, I am going to, what did he say here? Let's take a look at the, uh, um, Yeah, verse 22. The earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oils, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will saw her for her myself in the land. I'm going to plant you again. Now, first time when God told Hosea to name her his first son Jezreel, I'm going to scatter you. I'm going to destroy you like the, the, the house of you know Ahab. But now this time, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to plant you back. In verse 16, he said, In that day, in that day, what day? When Jesus comes, declare the Lord, You will call me my husband. And no longer will call, no longer will call me my Baal. Baal means master. Baal means master. So Sarah used to call Abraham Baal, my master. But you no longer call me master. You will call me my husband. It's different, right? Servant calls. Master, but you will call me my husband in that day because I will marry you. We are the bride of Jesus, right? 
Jesus is my groom. Right? Bride is the church, not just as a person. It's the church. It's the bride of Jesus. In verse 19 he said, I will betroth you to be uh, you to uh, me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. This is very important. And he will be our husband forever. And verse 23 was actually referenced in New Testament. We're going to take a look at Romans. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, we're going to read from verse 19. You shall say to me, then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what this molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, his endure with much patience vessel of wrath prepare for destructions in order to make known the riches of glory for vessel of mercy, which he has prepared before beforehand for glory even as whom he has called not from the Jews also but all uh, but also from the Gentiles as indeed he says in Hosea those who are not in my people I will call my people and her who was not beloved I will call beloved and in the very place where it was said to him you are not my people there they will be called the sons of the living God. And, and Isaiah cried out concerning Israelite, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as, one, uh, be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And the Isaiah predicted if the Lord of hosts has not left us offsprings, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So eventually, he said he will restore, just like what he said in Hosea. You can see that this promise was fulfilled when Jesus Christ came. And this prophecy was not only talking about Israel, because when you think about it, when Israel was destroyed, they never recover. The country of Israel never recover, never established again. But when Jesus Christ came, he reunited them and recover everything. And that's the prof prophecy that Hosea gave, which he did not see, of course, at, at the time. He didn't know what he was prophesying at the time, but that was a fulfilled in later time when Jesus came. This same exact thing was a reference also in First Peter as well. Let's go to First Peter. First Peter Chapter two. So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. 
as you come to him, a living stone rejected by man, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourself like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood in of a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that, are build, uh, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of a stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were uh, destined to do. But you are chosen race, royal priesthood, a holy nation's people for his own possessions, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received the mercy. This was the name of Hosea. Right? Which was fulfilled in the time when Jesus Christ died on a cross and resurrected and he made us to be his own people and we receive his mercy that's the story of Hosea so what God is saying because what you have done I will punish you because he is what God of justice God of righteousness so God of justice and righteousness he has to judge the sinner but at the same time he is a God of love so he shows mercy and grace and his love towards us I will destroy you I will punish you I will discipline you but I'm not killing you I will restore you and I am going to make you my children coming back to Hosea again chapter 3 and the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for fifteen shekels of a silver and a homer and a uh, latek of barley. And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore as belong to another man so will I able to uh, I also be uh, will I also be to you for the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince without sacrifice or pillar without epode or household gods afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and they shall come in fear to the Lord and his goodness in the latter days now do you understand what this means we'll just take a look at it again go again love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress even as the Lord loves the children of Israel though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin so what is God telling Hosea love your wife the whoredom wife the prostitute woman love her as I have loved Israel you and I now on the same page do you understand what I feel is it easy for you to love the whoredom some wife if God is telling you to do so do you think it's something that you could accept just like what I told you now your husband or your wife is at the door and they're trying to come back to you would you accept them easily 
It's not easy. You know how you would feel if you were in that shoes, right? But God is telling Hosea to love your woman. So verse 2, this is the key. So I bought her for 15 shekel of a silver and a homer and a latek of barley. Wait a second. Gomer is Hosea's wife. Now he has to go and buy her, paying the money to bring her back. Isn't it ridiculous? You have to pay the money to somebody to bring your wife back home? Why? Why do I have to pay someone else? He's a, her lover that I have to pay to bring my wife back. Isn't this ridiculous? But God is saying, do this because that's what I have done to Israel. And how much he had to pay? How much did he pay? 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a latex of barley. So when you actually add this up, it's worth of 30 shekel. 30 silver. Do you remember what that 30 silver means? So, God is saying, bring your wife back. You pay the money to bring your wife back. And you would understand what I feel now. How much I care, how much I want to keep my wife. And now, Hosea is learning how God feels. And God is saying, I say, I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You stay with me. Don't go anywhere. I will keep you. I will protect you. I will be with you. Don't go anywhere. Stay with me forever. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. Don't do this anymore. Stay with me. You're my wife. As God is actually saying to Israel, stay with me. Return to me. This is exactly what God is saying to Israel. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar. I don't need all this. Without epode or a household God. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God. After all this, when I bring you back to me, that I actually bought you back, then you're going to return to me and seek the Lord. Did God buy us? Yeah. He paid the price to buy us. He paid the price for us to bring me back. Treacherous, whoredom woman, God brought me back. This is the love of God. Was it easy? No, it is not easy. But that's what he wanted because of his endless love. And eventually, you will call me my God. So read this verse 5 again. Afterward, when Jesus Christ died and resurrected, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. Who is this David their king? This is Jesus. This is Jesus. David the king. Your king. One and only king that you always love. So David, what does that mean? David, beloved. David, the Jesus. 
and they shall come in fear to, to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Now, we truly love happy, happily ever after with Jesus. That's what it, that's what it means. Any question up to this point? 